uh, to uh, practices curating as research, a panel with four distinguished guests. I'm happy to um, welcome Christian Paul, Morten Sondergaard, Gabriel Manotti, and Laura Garcia. Uh, we have about 90 minutes together, so each of the panelists will uh, present about a 20 minute presentation, a little bit more, a little bit less, but we'll try to keep it around 20 minutes so we can have a good 10 minutes or more for conversation and Q&A afterwards. So I'll be giving each of them a, a five minute warning, so if you see my hand, um, that's what that's all about. So uh, welcome again, and Christian, I'll turn it over to you. for coming. I'm going to start with a couple of caveats. Um, the presentation I'm doing today is fairly atypical for me because it is more or less the presentation of a case study and of a collection that I visited as a research fellow. And the second caveat is that it is not about curating as research per se, but there is a lot of intersection with um, research. So in May 2014, uh, May and June 2014, I was invited uh, to be a fellow resident at the David Bermond Foundation and Collection in Santa Ines in California, basically just to study and write about the collection. And as you will see in the following, that collection is pretty uneven. There are really terrific pieces in it, but there are also pieces that over time, nobody probably would have paid attention to. And that is also precisely my point. I think it is part of human nature and also part of institutional research and curation that we create an echo chamber to some extent. You find the same people in the same context and we're looking at a twofold operation here because within the field of media art histories and particularly new media art histories, we're still trying so much to have the history of those media recognized by the mainstream, but at the same time, if you attended this um, conference uh, regularly or if you go to related talks, you will also come across the same um, information or many of the same examples again and again. So I think we also always have to try to not fall into uh, the trap of being very exclusive in what we present. And it's also natural that things fall through the crap, perhaps because they don't live up to the standards of um, what we consider high accomplishments in art. But the presentation of this collection in particular uh, tries to uh, establish a little bit more of context of people who were working from different areas in a field that is now considered to be the history of media art. And I want to uh, start by situating this a little bit in the context of larger exhibitions that have happened more recently. So in 2013, you had a big Julio Le Parc um, exhibition at the Palais uh, de Tokyo in um, Paris that was just one of a few recent shows that expressed a lot of interest in kinetic and light art, which is what the uh, Bermont Foundation focuses on. This year at the uh, Armory Art Show in New York, uh, Le Parc was also singled out as one of the most successful and best artists, if he actually sold um, that much or achieved high prices, I do not know. Um, but definitely you saw a lot of his work um, in the press. Then the Guggenheim Museum mounted Zero, Countdown to Tomorrow, focusing on the Zero Group. And um, I will just play a little bit from the introductory video on the um, webpage. The 50s to 60s is an exhibition that looks into a history that begins in Dusseldorf, Germany. In the late 1950s, Heinz Mach and Otto Pino were in school together in the Kunstakademie, the Art Academy in Dusseldorf. They very quickly moved on from being interested in the kind of expressive painting that was very predominant at the time. Sometimes it's referred to as Tashism in Art Informel. And one of the important moments for them was in 1957 when uh, they decided to begin holding single evening exhibitions in their studio. It was really this chance to have the freedom to show what they were thinking. There were no exhibition. Okay. So um, we've already heard about Zero in various um, talks at this conference, and um, I think it's great that the Guggenheim pays attention to this, 
graph came up in a few of the talks here. So there were, of course, a lot of um, art groups and movements and exhibition series at the time that still need to get more uh, attention by the mainstream uh, art world. Also recently, the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Houston mounted Cosmic Dialogues. This these are selections from their uh, Latin American collection, again focusing on kinetic and light art. And I do not think that it's coincidental that all of these exhibitions are coming up right now. I would argue that they are in fact prompted by a certain kind of awareness that all of these works, um, kinetic and light works and op art works, actually belong uh, into the history of media art, that they are connected or also the ancestry to some extent of the new media art we're looking at today. And at the same time, they're also a fairly safe integrated spot within the um, history of art. So rather than seeing uh, large scale exhibitions that really focus on a new media artist or that are overview shows of new media art in the 90s or 2000s, um, we're getting shows about um, kinetic art, light art, op art, which is great, but then again, you know, we also have to move forward. So I want to position the David Vermont collection in that context. It was built um, since 1965 and really uh, is a terrific little repository of the history of kinetic and op art. Uh, it was turned into the uh, Vermont Foundation in 1986 and Vermont very actively supported uh, experimental visual art. So what the collection really captures is one of the historical strands, uh, ancestries, lineages behind digital art, the one that is more focused on uh, movement, motion, optical and light effects. What is not in that collection is one of the other prominent strands that is based more in instruction-based and um, coded art. So when I arrived at the Vermont Foundation, it was actually Victoria Vesner who delivered me there, she went into the library and suddenly came back and brought back an old issue of Leonardo uh, magazine from 1974. Uh, kinetic art theory and practice, selections from the Leonardo Journal, and I realized that David Vermont had underlined a lot in that journal, read it word by word and underlined sentences. So his um, annotations of the Leonardo Journal, which of course also was one of um, the first um, today still existing magazines on that subject, also for me became a kind of guidance through, um, for looking at the collection. So one of the sentences he underlined uh, was by Robert Henry saying, I have designed a mechanism for elliptical rotations, but I have not yet been able to execute the design for lack of financial resources. And what Vermont then continued to do was provide artists with those financial resources uh, for realizing their work. Another um, quote that struck me from the same article was very much focused on the aesthetics of kinetic art in connection to contemplation. Of course, every act of contemplation is ultimately a mentally interactive one. Um, but what the abstract here points out is that art which is subject to change must also be apprehended as a total structure. And that is still one of the big challenges of any kind of interactive uh, work where you may capture moments but um, if it's, for example, drawing from a database that consti uh, constantly renews the visuals, if you do not understand the concept and log logic of the whole, then you're missing a lot more than you would uh, miss when you're walking out of uh, video art. So I broke up the collection into um, several thematic complexes, one of them being uh, kinetics and optics and abstract imagery. And there's so much work that I'm going to kind of race through it with only brief um, descriptions. So one thing th that struck me um, was that there are a lot of almost light boxes or um, objects that create uh, movement through optics. This is a really fascinating piece that I wasn't um, familiar with and the first one that uh, entered the collection in that if you actually stand in front of it, it's completely flat. It's just aluminum straps on a board and you see absolutely no curvature. It's all in the optical effect, but it's a completely 2D and flat uh, piece. 
There are also um, quite a few light boxes. Uh, Mata Boto uh, came up in one of the presentations um, yesterday. So here again, you have a whole space that is um, created through light and its reflection in this mirrored box with um, slits in the metal um, background. Heinz Mack, one of the members of the um, Zero Group, creates his light dynamo both through movement and reflection. Uh, refraction. So here you have uh, kind of a double working. On the one hand, these um, are actually moving panels, and on the other one, of course, the light uh, refractions create an extra motion element. And then um, a piece from Nicolas Schaeffer's Microton um, series. And what he tries to capture here is the split second between the movement, the color, and um, how vision picks it up ultimately and what happens in that space um, between the video documentation is not very good. So you have um, also um, different, um, different colors that are cycling through and it's a whole series of projects. And while this is not part of the Vermont Foundation uh, CISB, which again, was mentioned by Simon Penny yesterday in his talk, was really um, considered one of the groundbreaking first um, sculptures working with um, sensors to capture um, motion and light. And um, it was um, co created in collaboration um, with Philips. And I think that little clip on the streets of Paris is the only one surviving of its uh, outdoor manifestation in action. Then. One, again, one of the more established um, and by now famous and well-known um, artists and co-founder of the Zero Group, um, Otto Piener and his light belay, which was also uh, represented in the Guggenheim show in a different manifestation. So um, going back in time, we often situate that work within the 60s, and that is when the term op art was created, of course, but um, Duchamp's roto-reliefs, also a very famous example in this area, were, of course, done much, much earlier, um, originally meant um, for a film, and he envisioned these to be played on a turned table when he created them. So basically like music, the manifestation um, that it took later was basically these um, discs, six discs in this case that you can um, change and put um, onto the piece. Most of the time when this is gets exhibited in a museum context, you're not able to touch it, of course, and exchange the uh, plates and activate um, the work. But it's quite fascinating in its um, optical effects, again, flat imagery that creates virtual volumes, as Molinage would call it. Yeah. Then from um, yet another era, the neon works that were created in the 70s and 80s often drop out of that um, discourse. There's a spinning shaft by uh, Alejandro and Moira uh, Sina. And um, if it's not in action, like in the uh, image at the bottom, it just consists of these tubes but can create really stunning visual effects. Another work they did that is also represented in the Bermond Foundation is the lasso, and I'll forward a little bit to give you a range of the effects. So obviously the experience changes quite a bit depending on where you stand under this piece, if you're looking up, if you're uh, viewing it sideways. So there's um, a whole body of work that very often doesn't appear in this um, context. And then again, earlier historical um, piece, you may be familiar with uh, Thomas Wilfred's uh, Lumia project. So this is the Clavilux Junior, and it is a predecessor ultimately of television uh, based arts. So in this case, we're looking at electronics and gels and mirrors that create this polymorphous stream of color. Uh, Wilfred is also often credited with actually having invented the TV remote control in the 1930s because you are navigating this piece by turning knobs on an actual remote. Uh, he came to uh, the US from Denmark and 
came up with the concept of Lumia as a kind of color music and started uh, doing and performing Lumia concerts as early as 1922. Unfortunately, um, very few of the Clavilux um, juniors survived. So here a little excerpt, again underlined by David Bermond, from a letter that Thomas um, Wilfred um, wrote uh, complaining about architects <laughs> and um, the intersections between uh, sculpture and architecture. So um, he's complaining here that architects very often do not welcome the lighting artist as someone who, like an architect, would create spaces and um, that this creates a kind of uh, friction, which I just found interesting in the historical context. Today, these practices have become so uh, intermingled and intermeshed that they are very hard to um, separate. And then, of course, Namjoon Pike's um, participation on uh, TV is yet another um, project that belongs into this category, and you can easily see the connection between the clavy looks and this one. So um, here, uh, basically comment on the electronic uh, image where you manipulate the signal with your voice. Another um, project that is in the Bermont collection is Namjoon Paik's uh, Virtually Wise, which has a, an is interesting um, history. This was a project that uh, Paik created in 1994 in honor of um, Wise, who of course mounted some of the early computer art um, shows which have become really famous, and he, uh, I created this piece for an exhibition at the Whitney Museum, which was a restaging of the Howard Weiss Gallery's TV as a creative medium from 1969. We're talking a lot about restaging and remounting of exhibitions and works today. So in 94, the Whitney decided to um, show TV as a creative uh, medium again and remount it. And um, Pike actually created that um, piece specifically for that um, show. So since I only have um, a few more um, minutes, I want to kind of race through some of the other um, categories. There's a whole body that focuses on kinetics and um, systems. So very um, often works that in this case work with high voltage, cork Markeski's pieces, sparks a lot, it's another manifestation of these voltage pieces, less known. A um, lot of projects by George Rhodes in the um, exhibition, wall-mounted pieces. I think Rhodes is ultimately more known for his outdoor um, big sculptures, so here's another one, blue shamrock <laughs> kinetic systems that play out um, on the wall. And then there's a whole body of work about kinetics and sound. You may be familiar with Takis um, musical London, which is one of the iconic pieces in which he uses magnets and guitar string and electricity to have the sculpture um, create music. And um, Peter Vogel very explicitly referencing cybernetics in the cybernetic relief that you navigate with your uh, shadow as a sound composition. So what is hanging on the wall as a sculptural notation system ultimately also uh, functions as notes that can be activated through your body. Um, the Basquiat brothers did uh, in the 70s a lot of metal sculptures that would create their sound through activation. So there is uh, a little fountain in the Mermont collection and also very nicely outside before you enter the actual building, you have these musical roses welcoming you. Christian Markley is um, typically not thought of as a um, kinetic artist, but of course a lot of his works also um, incorporate elements of movement uh, for activating sound. If you go online, you can f um, find video clips by Bill Frizzell playing um, this wind-up guitar and other very um, established musicians. And then finally, um, there is a whole section of kinetic works that reference cybernetic biologies and the human um, form. Again, one of the better known landmark pieces, James C. Wright's plants, house plants. So these are actually reacting um, to light and humidity and temperature in opening and closing computer controlled 
um, they are meant for outdoor, but um, of course that's also a risk in, uh, in putting them out there. And this is a f funny piece, not the best choice of music. I see this as a predecessor to the many ferrofluid works that um, became so popular and won major awards at the graph. Uh, so this is um, a little landscape that is built of iron powder and also functions as a as a mu music box. So <laughs> your iron power moves to pump up the gym. Not the best choice, probably. <laughs> there are also more classical music pieces um, in the collection. And um, I'll end it with um, Tung Lee's Tokyo Girl. Um, Tung Lee, of course, known for it, his um, kinetic sculptures and self-destroying machines. I think this work has a lot of um, humor and is also very much grounded in the practice um, of that time. So I also want to um, end by pointing out that it would be dangerous to assume that we can create a simple narrative for all of these pieces and how they ultimately hang together because the reasons why artists explored these areas in different decades and how they perceived them at the time um, vary dramatically. If you look at the um, rhetoric as the literature, we incorporate them today into the history of new media art from a fairly different angle. And I want to um, end with a quote by Frank Molina in this Leonardo issue that again was highlighted by David Bermond where he says, although kinetic art is now taken seriously by the art world in many advanced technological societies, it will probably take several more decades before large numbers of art lovers turn to it for emotional satisfaction. At present, only a few museums have permanent displays of kinetic artworks and a staff capable of conserving them. I'm not sure if um, Frank Molina at the time was thinking about 40 years when he said several decades. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, Morten, please take the stage. It's useful, as you said, Christian, to have this uh, other set of uh, examples and ideas and uh, pieces to add to our vocabulary. It's very important. I'm going to speak to the, uh, uh, the question of the sound citizen and the, the, the notion of curating sound art in the public space. And uh, my paper will revisit and contextualize uh, some curatorial practices and research methodologies from uh, the past two decades, which I've been involved in myself, where curating is framing research into sound as a medium for art. Um, as well as the uh, writing of uh, sound art histories, whatever that is. So I will argue in the following that uh, a curating-based research methodology makes it possible to study sound art as the truly transdisciplinary field of practice that it is. Moreover, it bro broadens the scope of research, allowing the investigations into the hybrid hybridizations of artistic practices and to include questions arising from the world of the citizen, society, and the so-called post-digital uh, audience, whatever that is as well. There are many open questions here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm also going to name uh, or try to play with uh, this notion of, of the, uh, the sound citizen and the post-digital audi audience uh, and uh, name it uh <clears throat> an implied producer, but it's a little bit outside the scope of this paper to go into precisely what an implied producer is, but I will point towards it <coughs> as I go through some of the examples I have. But my claim is that media are viewed through the curation of sound art uh, not only reveals uh, the close affinity to the distributed public space and the citizen of the mediated, uh, what Habermas used to call the bürgerliche Offenlichkeit, the post-Habermas situation. It, it also makes it possible to investigate and reflect on media art as a dynamic and complex field of production. 
I'm doing this in a little bit <coughs> uh, untraditional way. I had to, do not have a PowerPoint. Uh, I opted out of that. Um, I, rather, I'm trying to uh, uh, show that curating is, uh, instead of being a tool for representing the cognitive real, I will show uh, or, or point towards it as an act of excribing, uh, which means reading and uh, writing it elsewhere, what has been going on. It's like I'm trying to use my computer and the curating I've done earlier as, a, as a, an archive, and I'm excribing this archive uh, as I read and write it to you. Um, so uh, this is a bit of an experiment. I haven't done it before, so it might actually just go haywire. But um, the, the, the real, um, <clears throat> the layers of this is actually what I ha have on the computer. It's uh, what is on the internet. But it's also what I've been writing uh, about uh, my own curating uh, projects 10 years ago and uh, also shorter, uh, shorter while ago. So in what f follows, I will revisit and describe some examples of my curator based research into this field. I will look at uh, Undercover, and I have this quote. I don't want to read the quotes aloud. I just show it from my notes. Uh, the Chun quote, quote here about excribing it, the Jean-Luc Nancy uh, um, idea. Um, but I'm going into Undercover, the, uh, the, the exhibition I did in uh, 2003 called Sound Art in Social Spaces. I'm going to talk a little bit about the audio bar from the Media Art Platform project, which I, both of them curated in Roskilde when I was a curator there at the Museum of Contemporary Art. I'm going a little bit into Stellarc, the Internet Ear project at the Biotopia Arts and Center in 2010. And finally, I will end up speaking a little bit about, which is also uh, uh, going to be a book launch this later this, uh, this afternoon, Elke uh, Kuriniemi and the uh, installation we did at uh, the ZKM in 2012 called Elke versus Elke. Uh, so let's see how this goes. And I will, I will actually go through three layers of inscription, <laughs> which makes it even e easier to follow, I'm sure. Uh, one is, uh, it's, and I'm going through them as curatorial actions, and the first one is uh, the action of uh, the political unconscious. So here we go. This, this is actually the undercover, under, undercover uh, website, which is not uh, online anymore, so I only have it on my computer. I'm going to show you a little bit of that. Let's see if I have some sound. I do. Um, so the only place I have this is actually on my computer set, and um, I just wanted to show you a little bit of what um, this project was uh, doing. So I went in the wrong place here. <coughs> it was taking place in the uh, in the space of uh, Roskilde, which is uh, um, it's a smaller town outside Copenhagen, and we have this. Uh, there is this uh, square in the center of the city. It's a very old city. All the kings are buried there. That's another story. And, and there's a lot of Viking ships in the fjord. But um, uh, it, the museum was located, uh, and is still located in the old castle there. And uh, that's the 1, 2, and 10 number you can see uh, up, up there. Um, this is an old flash site. I, I cannot make it bigger than this. But I just wanted to show you a number of the projects um, a point towards them that was uh, that were there. Uh, one of them uh, is uh, Brandon Bell's and, and, and the Doppel, um, which was uh, located in the uh, in the main square or the inner square of, of the of the museum, and was uh, quoting uh, some uh, a, a piece by John Cage, uh, event and its uh, Doppel, and trying to locate that as a, an architecture. In the in the museum uh, outer space, and uh, uh, Scanner and Matthias Eck uh, were were working with ideas of how to uh, describe actually uh, sound as as a means of social interaction, but inside the museum, taking sounds from the outside into the the museum itself. We had a project going on in, in what was then very normal to see in the public space, the telephone boxes, and uh, a, 
really a project which was about uh, having a whispering uh, sensation in the public space, which then stopped when, uh, when you entered the telephone boxes. These boxes were actually accused of being uh, propaganda uh, as the Ira Iraqi war was starting at the same time as the opening of the exhibition. So that's an kind of a, a, a incidental overlap. But there was a number of projects, and the final one I want to just point towards you is, I'm just uh, sieving through them here, um, is the uh, Karl Michael von Hauswolf uh, project developed for the local bank, uh, where he created a, a sound design or a, a composition for the in line where you're waiting for getting your turn in, in, the, in the bank. So you, you were followed by a small composition from you the moment you take the, the number and you you go to the to the to the cashier and and so and the bank actually allowed this and we were even able to uh, enter their systems which I'm sure is impossible today. So Karl Michael von Hauswolf created this um, um, this this piece uh, which uh, in in turn also created a, a a situation where people suddenly experience sound art. Uh, in a place where they uh, did not expect it to be. So I have, and I will, I will actually kill this sound because otherwise you will be crazy. So I have this uh, quote from Frederick Jameson, which was the, the primary inspiration for me to do this undercover project back then. Um, I'm just showing it on, on the screen there. Um, but at the beginning, Back then, I, I was I was uh, writing in in the uh, in in the curatorial statement uh, that I uh, wrote back then, and so this is kind of a move back to what I wrote back then. I wrote at the beginning of the new millennium, we receive aesthetic experience wherever we go, on an unprecedented scale. Old patterns and aesthetic codes and traditions are changing radically. Frederick Jameson captures the basic atmosphere in the political unconscious. However, it is some symptomatic that whereas Jameson in 1981 writes about literary experience, then the political unconscious today may be seen as a metaphor the, for the cross-aesthetic mode which permeates social spaces. This was in 2003. With the development of the cross-aesthetic mode, artists uh, increasingly choose to blend their work into everyday and social life. So art cannot continue like in the old days if it still wants to make a difference. And here, it's important to, to point towards the impact on anything that goes beyond the cultural field is really what the artist wants. So artistic practices are a contemporary dynamics engaging everyday life as canvases or scenes for their activities. Here, it is blurring the difference between art and life and it is this apparent blur of art and the emergence of something else, anything else, in a political and conscious field that I'm trying to explore in the exhibition undercover. So this was what I was uh, writing back then, and this goes into a, an action that I just call you the called the political unconscious, the action, uh, curatorial action into the political unconscious. The second layer of curatorial action I want to po uh, point towards is a post, what is called post-cognitive art. It's really uh, a, a dialogue with Dick Higgins, uh, because in a, in a in, in, as I'm sure you know, in a dialectic of, of uh, centuries, he writes that, um, or he describes how a post-cognitive art shows up in the late 50s which have a totally different approach to life, reality, and artistic processes. We may have seen some of, uh, of these uh, in, in the presentation just before, actually, and, and also we have uh, witnessed some of the earlier presentations in this conference as well, going into this, I think. So what Dick Higgins describes here is the beginning of an undercover art, I'm claiming. Art that uses the realities and media we encounter in our daily lives, and the metaphors we live by as a material for discourse on change. Art which is seeking our relational dialogues rather than merely pointing at the superficial and effective. The artwork becomes a matrix, a collection of combinations in which all possible meanings can arise. And meanings here could imply what 
what, uh, and I would like to suggest that, that John Cage was talking about transmissions of relationships that occur, occur in a field where historical or theoretical knowledge is, is in a way in, 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 um, in transit as well. So, so there is this open field of possibility, a playing field. Um, <clears throat> so with Cage and Higgins, it is possible to establish a framework for an early discourse of art's blur or ubiquitous interweaving into daily life. A discourse which is aimed at making life into an artwork in a way and use the potential reality found there as a material. In a neocortex cognitive paradigm, a hier hierarchy of art genres still dominates the aesthetic perception and the disappearance of art in plain sight should be seen as an, an imminent criticism of this paradigm. So the possibility to go undercover and it should be seen as a possibility as an artist is limited by the detour of, uh, of the political unconscious. If Jameson is right, the artist is always involved in an unconscious political discourse. However, neither the hierarchy of the arts and the traditional framework of the political unconscious is untouched by the cul cultural change that media, culture, and information society and digitization is triggering. And back then, I was quoting Kittler. Uh, again, I'm passing in and out of texts that I, I wrote uh, earlier on. Um, Kittler, of course, uh, as you well know, claims the that the boundary between media and life is blurring. There is this um, um, uh, this this uh, tendency to focus on on uh, on uh, on a culture dominated by effects on the surface, and 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 really trying to find out what, how to approach art in, in in on a different level, you might say, on a different in a different situation. And uh, <clears throat> again, if we accept Kittler's point of view, we are faced with a situation which is not only radically different from the traditional aesthetic perceptions relate to, but always uh, it, rad it also it radicalizes both Cage's and Higgins' positions uh, and points in several new ways. So uh, Jacques Attali, I also find, is voicing this skepticism um, that I'm pointing towards here, that th the sense of ubiquitously mediated sound and the effect on the citizen it might have, the digital media, according to Atali, create a kind of survival space, and it's it's also the it's it's a, it's a situation, as he says, that that the typo topologies uh, are torn down, uh, and uh, and and there is a disappearance of the world, dissolution of an aesthetic, and the slipping away of knowledge. As he says in this um, quote, yes, thank you. So, <clears throat> the complexity of of uh, and th of the disappearance of a world, uh, the dissolution of an aesthetic uh, of a distributed uh, social space and the territory of the sound citizen, as I'm claiming here, is what my curatorial research has been um, trying to. Uh, go into and investigate from a number of different uh, perspectives. And apart from the undercover exhibition that I just pointed you towards, I, unfortunately, I don't have any more uh, material. Um, well, I have some sound, but that I don't have time for that um, here. Uh, it, it, it's actually this, uh, this, uh, uh, this flash site that I luckily uh, uh, saved on my hard drive back then. But another project I want to just uh, briefly point out to you is the Media Art Platform project that we uh, did uh, slightly later, um, which included uh, a number of, of <coughs> strategical, you might say, uh, inscriptions of uh, the, the, the archive of the museum in Roskilde. Excuse me. One of the things we, we did was the uh, audio bar, and this is footage from uh, to kill this bastard. Here we go. <laughs> so, so this is the audio bar, um, and what was uh, the idea with uh, the media platform was to create um, uh, situations where you have the tangible and bodily interfaces uh, working uh, 
well, working as interfaces to a collection of sound art in this case. We, we did other uh, uh, projects as well, uh, one working with metadata and one working with the um, social context of the museum. But this was uh, specifically about the sound art collection. As you can see, when you change the bottles, you change, uh, you hear a new uh, uh, thing from the, from the archive. And it's not the same thing every time, and you can mix your drinks. So what we did was to, m to create a situation around this um, social space of, of the bar and uh, map it onto the, uh, the distributed social space. Well, what we're claiming is a distribu distributed social space of an archive. So just to show this point, and another project um, also in the same category, but approaching uh, that from a totally different angle uh, is the Internet Ear by Stellark. Uh, it was commissioned by the Biotopia exhibition in 19, uh, <laughs> sorry, 2010. Um, here uh, he is uh, talking about it in, in Olbor, uh, Denmark. And what is really here is, 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 um, is, is an exploration of, of uh, the techno technological sensuality and the, 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 the ways that this is um, uh, also excribing uh, our, uh, you could say, the traditional, um, traditional aesthetics, what we normally would uh, opt for in, in a neocortex cognitive situation, you might say. So here, the, what, what Stilag is questioning is also this uh, situation of the body as, as, uh, as a starting point for an aesthetics and how that is actually acted out through technology and of course through this, um, um, it did, the, well, it did the, 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 there's only the arm there. So there's a kind of a, uh, of, of, of a, uh, a body falling apart or an obsolete body as, as Stilag is also uh, calling it, and this met th these metaphors of of having a bar representing uh, or being the stage for a, an, a, an archive, or <laughs> a, a, an ear being the stage for an, a conversation, uh, and, and an arm being a, the stage for a conversation over the internet, a distributed public space. Um, both are talking to to the third. Uh, level of uh, layer of, of curatorial action, which I will end by just pointing towards, uh, which is the, the, the curation of agency realism. Um, and I have a quote somewhere, or I didn't, well, um, f from Andrew Pickering, I will read it instead. If the Western tradition aimed at representational realism, Pickering says, the works I have in mind, uh, um, the works I have in mind aim at what one could call agency realism, not the portrayal of how things look, but how things go, an experimental openness to emergence and the adaptation rather than control. Thus, to end up with Curinami as promised, the stage is set for a uh, maybe a distributed cognivitation of art, and um, by virtue of the social encounters of people around the situations, the curatorial situation, the curatorial actions, and, and the descriptions of how we are operating with these actions, we become aware of un unconscious structures that penetrate the democratic culture, and in this sense, uh, it is political, I will claim. Now, this final uh, example, and I know I'm tr progressing uh, rather fast here, and actually I also want to end up by um, pointing uh, out that Catherine Hales has been very um, influential in, on, on the way I've presented uh, this, the her idea of the technogenesis and um, also what she calls the distributed, the distributed cognition, the, 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 hyper, the hyper reality of, of uh, techno, techno, technological um, influx on our life, our daily life, and how we imagine it. Um, and this was also feeding into this uh, installation we did for the ZKM uh, in, in 2012 as part of the Unheard Avant-Garde section there, which I also curated, where we fed 
all of that we could find from Aki Kurinami on the internet and, and all kinds of media into his own instrument. And we, you could choose which instrument you wanted to have that fed into. So it actually creates a kind of a, uh, a sound uh, work of its own by uh, <coughs> we, we uh, managed to, to create a digital version of the, of the DV. So, so the, the films that you're watching are also becoming a, 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 an electronic uh, composition in itself. And uh, the whole space is, is also constructed so that you can have the embodied interaction as well. You can shift into play mode where you can play with the room through the, uh, through the, uh, the, the, the situation of this um, uh, instrument. So um, just to, to f round off, I'm, I'm proposing that, that the media archives here, the, the sound art, situations, not least uh, the one with the Akikunami Kuriniemi, is not to be seen a as a result of documentation process in an any, any traditional sense. Underneath these archives or, or these uh, situations of sound art, and uh, or rather ahead of the production of these, these, uh, uh, these situations, um, there are these uh, citizen spaces and these uh, action spaces of the citizen and of the the artist that 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 is unfolding on, a, on, a, on a, an unconscious uh, level, and in this in this way, it's actually pointing towards. Well, the scribing is actually pointing towards a kind of a a, a, a deconstruction of, of how we are uh, how we are seeing and 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 also gathering uh, the archives that we think we know so well. And maybe the, the point here is that we need to go new directions to actually really get into the, 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 the framing, the true framing of what media art is, also a, in, a, in a curatorial practice. Yes. So that's it. <laughs> very much the framing of media art history, and particularly this one because of the topic on research creation. I consider myself a sort of research creator, closet research creator since forever, <laughs> and it's something that I started to articulate more, more openly or to embrace since my PhD, which was a pretty regular pussy, and I'll be bringing some of these ideas here today. I hope it doesn't sound too dry or too much of an ego trip, really. <laughs> But anyway, I want to make a case for research creation, or how they call in the UK practice-based research, and particularly uh, about curating as a method for research creation, which I like very much for a number of reasons, which I hope to make clear today. But in a way, I think that curating gives us a lot of opening for anomalies, for particularities, for situatedness, and for Something else that I forgot, but I'll, I'll remember <laughs> before the end of this talk. Yes. Well, yes. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, you probably saw in the in the topic in in the yeah listing that the, the name is projection studies, which well I'll, I'll 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 bridge things here. Don't worry. I hope that I will. But anyway, first of all, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about curating, because there's a lot of of discussion about curating in in terms of media arts, regular discussions. Let's say uh, well, not really. We've seen many different and, and exciting things here, but it's not about curating as preservation, as, as conservation of, of media arts and all the problems that, that come with that. It's not about the curator as the superstar curator, as an auteur, as, as, as someone that genius creator, no, not at all. On the contrary, what interests me in curating is how low profile it can be and how it's working very close to the infrastructure and to, to make things more philosophical, I like curating, to think of curating as producing, or better yet, articulating presences. Or, 
in another way, uh, managing access, producing encounters, perhaps. And for me, this, this allows the curator to have a very ambiguous role between what uh, Flusser would call a functionary of many apparatus to which he, he owes his work, for example, the institution with, he, with, with, with which he is working and the context to which he's bringing stuff or artists, and as well of, of the artist, but he's also able to do some programming and, and step beyond. He's in a very interesting position because, well, in one of the talks this morning, we were talking about infrastructure and about gray literature, and I think that curating has very much to do with this, with these invisible zones, with these invisible spaces that we are not aware. And uh, that's why I, I evoke the projection is because my particular experience with curating, which is not formal at all, began as a projectionist in a film society. And this brings you very close to the machine, and this makes you understand that to produce the presence of a movie in a screen, there's a lot of work going on, and you, you don't only engage with the moving image as a visual phenomena, you engage with it in, as a very complex object, which has a very complex presence. In our case, when I started, it was a pirate film society, so there was always this looming fear of the legal aspects of the movie, or, I mean, the owners, the, the copyright holders, and what they would do to us when they discovered what we were doing. Um, so I think that curator curating, first of all, allows for this very close uh, engagement with infrastructures and with the, the actual Com well, very complex dimensions of the objects in question. In, in a very convoluted way, this work with curating led to my PhD, which had a very boring or, or silly question at the time, which was like, what is cinema? It's 2008 and there's all this, this problem with, with the film studies discipline or screen studies in the UK that, well, what will be of cinema when the materiality of the film is done. What will be of cinema when everything is substituted by digital imagery? And which seemed like a very crucial problem for people, but it didn't to me, and I couldn't understand why. So perhaps the more interesting thing that I started to realize is why, why I have a different feeling about all this than these other, than the whole field in a way or another. And I realized that it had a lot to do with this experience in projection. Because on the one hand, one thing that, that kind of solves the dilemma of the end of film and the end of the film studies discipline is, okay, so, but digital is also material, okay? And we talked about a lot of it in, in this conference and in other venues. But having the experience with projection and organizing projection I also knew that, I realized that the analog is very much machinical and there isn't any sort of, of uh, complete whole reality or existence to the projected film. We normally consider the film, the end of film as, as the end of a stable signifier for the moving image, but in fact, there's no stability in projection at all. The time, which is considered uh, generally considered like an intrinsic dimension of the moving image is only produced by the projector or while the image is being projected. So there is this idea that there is the, the, the time and the, and the movement and the size and scale of the cinematographic image, for example, they are results of its enactment of the enactment of the image by the projector mechanism. And so you, you start to realize how images are kind of produced by their movement. And you start to change your, your the concept of movement related to moving images. Uh, st stop thinking about it as a sort of intrinsic quality or parameter of the movie and start to consider as a condition for the existence of the image. Uh, and in that sense, I had a sort of insight uh, with, a, with a curatorial and then a book project by Dominique Paini, which is called Projections, uh, Le Transport des Images, so the transports of image. And then the idea of projection started to grow as an heuristic or as, as a concept to understand images. 
and to understand the, the existence of images. And to consider that every transport is uh, a means of transforming or, or informing the final phenomenon. And of course, the whole of the, the whole of the curator in this process seemed very important to me because in the end he he would be kind of making these these final connections. And in that sense, again, he would be a very the first hand witness of how the project how the process worked when in when it comes of, of like projecting something here or or bringing a movie from another country to Brazil, for example. And suddenly everything for me started to be, as someone else mentioned also in the, in the panel this morning, a sort of discursive problem of how we understand, how we conceptualize cinema and the moving image and even the discipline. And this has two, two major uh, effects. One of them is sort of moving the, the, the focus of the, of the research from like sheer technology to the way that technology is appropriated and articulated in society. And the other is acknowledging also the whole of academic research and of things that people are writing and doing uh, as ways of producing the response of what is cinema. Does that make any sense? Hope so. No, it doesn't. It does. Okay. So yes. Anyway, I, it might sound a bit too much, but I realized that. Well, okay. Writing this thesis, I'm kind of ex answering what is cinema. Okay. And that when I and I reach another kind of wall, because while the research was kind of digging into into structures and kind of moving from discursive formations into discourse networks and trying to understand how, how all these things were articulated, not only in terms of categories and taxonomies, but also by uh, social technical ensembles. I realized that in the end, my findings would come back to the text. And that's the way they would circulate and then feedback into the cinematographic circuit, into the definition and into the very organization of what cinema was. And I realized that at the same time we, we kind of embrace media archaeology, we also need new forms of media museography, new forms of bringing these findings into, into the world. And how much time do I have? Enough. <laughs> I think there's two advantages to that. One of them is like bringing the objects or the others into our discourse. Of course, there's a lot of problems in curating, but I feel that for me it gives an opportunity to actually engage things or put things in touch or other people in touch with, uh, let's say, the audience, the public, creating public for forums for encounters. Which is interesting when you're talking about artworks or, or objects or let's say, because you open this space for the object to act or to fail, to really fail. Normally when, when you consider, like when you're writing things down, you're reducing the object to the dimensions that interest you. But if the object is there, there is always the potential of something else happening. And I think that's also important when you consider the voices of others and for me, it's very difficult, even though I support many different causes of minorities, for example, it's very different for me to talk for them. And I think that curation uh, allows me to open a space for these others to speak for themselves. Um, also, there is this idea that there is another dimension of publicness to an exhibition or to a curatorial project, then there is to regular academic discourses enacted by or through conferences or papers, which might be an interesting uh, cue for me to just mention some projects. Uh, when I went back to Brazil, I started doing some research on, let's say, the archaeology of vertical images. 
And part of the process of, which was very strange for, the, for my students because it's a regular, very, very traditional film, film production course that I'm teaching. And one of the strategies for that, to create a sort of environment for discussion in the university was to organize a vertical video exhibition. And I, I had the help of the students to mount the screen vertically, to mount the projector vertically. And it was very, five minutes, it was, Was, which was very exciting in a way because it uh, it allowed the students. No, it's not it. Where is it? It allowed the students to realize that if they wanted to work with an unusual, with an abnormal format, with something that went out of the technical standards, they had to also change the structures of exhibition. Uh, to which again, this it won't appear. Anyway, it was interesting also to consider how this made the case for vertical videos as well. If you if you go to the internet and look for vertical videos, the first the first video that you find is a video against vertical videos, which brings us back to yes, brings us back to the idea of how media is defined discursively. Nowadays, some, some applications don't allow you to record your, your video vertically. And one of the interesting things about this, this, this short, this small exhibition that we organized is that the students were pretty excited about it. And even though today I'm still waiting for the final paper of this project to be published because of all the peer reviewing process and normal in academia, I had one student from another course looking at me uh, looking for me to to help him producing his final project as a video that uses different framings of the image. So in a way, this sort of contamination also interests me a lot. And in that sense, I think that curating allows for a work of media ecology, not in the sense only of approaching media structures as environments in which we dwell, but also in the sense that Matthew Fuller gives to this term as a sort of ecological activism. In, so we kind of promote in the, in the field, in the circuit, the things that we, we think are interesting for it. Uh, in the sense of vertical videos, there's nothing particularly interesting, uh, there's nothing in particular that attracts me to vertical videos themselves, but I like the idea that people should be able to experiment and, and think outside of the, of the frame. Five minutes. Well, I'll probably finish before. Uh, I shouldn't have rushed in the beginning. And uh, so this was a very small and simple project, but that for me had a very strong result, even though particular one. And that's probably this. And maybe it's worth mentioning another project, which is a more serious one, that I organized in the Sao Paulo Biennial of 2010 called Tape Deck Solos. Uh, in the beginning, it was a sort of, uh, of a provocation against the idea of audiovisual performances and, and liveness, what it is to project and, and edit live. So, and, uh, but it also became a sort of, of immediate media archeology span with something that people didn't even realize it was obsolete yet, which are videotapes. I invited 12 people from, from filmmakers, non-filmmakers, to video artists, to regular people, to kind of bring their tapes, which was any kind of tape, really. Most people thought I was talking about VHS, but I, it could be like mini DV or Betacam. And they were invited to present this material, raw material, in, in a screen, operating just one, one uh, VCR, we have two here because it's one for each format. And the interesting thing is that I didn't know what would come out of it and people didn't either. But for many, it was an opportunity to revisit images that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. And since they don't have this equipment at home, 
they they met it for the first time after I don't know 10 or 20 years during the presentation. Uh, each presenter had uh, one hour to just browse through their, their images and present to, to the audience and talk about or over them. And it become a kind of very interesting, uh, there was a very interesting situation because we were talking yesterday about uh, unfinished movies. And some of these raw materials, some of it were like the, the raw tapes of movies that were actually made or family movies. But one particular project from Lucas Bambosi was a video that st he started doing a documentary and in the process he realized that he could not finish it as a movie because of ethical reasons. And he just forgot the whole thing and locked it away. But in this particular situation, which was him, me and, and some like 20 people in the audience, he was able to bring these images and the situation also in the history uh, behind them uh, to the fore and kind of actualizes the situation or actualizes them among us. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, which I think is another, another degree of agency that curating has that's very interesting in the sense of perhaps commissioning in the sense of uh, allowing things to come or, or be presented or made real. I think that's, thanks so much. Thank you, Adriana. And our last presenter, Laura. My uh, last work uh, as a curator has been, uh, I've been invited to, to create uh, four artists uh, from the, the United Kingdom into Mexico. Uh, it was a project funded by British Council and we were presenting uh, an ex exhibition that was entitled Soundscapes, uh, UK Mexico. And uh, we were trying as well to break the constraints of the traditional exhibition and we were incorporating um, the production the, the production of a workshop that uh, was a uh, resulting of this lab uh, the we produced some uh, uh, objects that were finally included into the exhibition so we thought that uh, in this way the exhibition turned into a lab and I just need to stop And uh, well, that's my previous work. Um, I'm here presenting uh, this research. Um, it's a self-publishing print on demand that I entitled Sound as a Technological Medium. Um, it's a, a research um, development that uh, where I analyze uh, sound as a technological medium. Um, I've ordered in different chapters um, the, the definition of sound that gives me a more um, chances to introduce new, new theories into, in, um, into art practice or curatorial development. Um, and then I've ordered uh, four blogs um, that allowed me to distribute different type of works that could be sonic landscape, non-responsive systems, software-based art, and uh, women's uh, working in, in art. So the idea of uh, this order is um, based in um, traditional um, traditional disciplines. So this is a um, an this would be a, a necessary tool um, uh, for uh, researching uh, creating new media. Um, is what I'm interested in uh, curatorial development and cultural management. So I decided to uh, just focus on. Um, 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 uh, in integrate this uh, sound uh, as a technological media in, uh, in infrastructures like Ars Electronica, ZKM, ICIA, uh, ICC Tokyo, is as well uh, convert uh, institutions and universities um, for, uh, uh, so it has to be a tool for um, exhibitions, courses, seminars, conferences, uh, and workshops. I have experience uh, at the university as well, so 
teaching um, to college students, so the idea is to transform digital art departments into audio labs and media labs, sound labs, um, and as well um, collaborate with festivals and hacker spaces. And this idea is uh, also influenced by quantum networks, um, like how complex systems nowadays and disruptive uh, economies transform the new media curatorial um, producing uh, emergent circuits. So I've been working with uh, uh, various files of uh, new media art uh, in previous exhibitions. I've worked with net art, software-based art, video art, stream art, database art, code art, sonic art, interactive art, and intermedia art. And um, um, in this book, I take as well references from the um, background on the origins of electronic art, experiments with art and technology, radio art, and uh, I'm linking that to contemporary artists that work in the development of sensors or other tools that um, they're interested um, for art production. Um, it's a connection into art, science, and technology, and it gives me, I don't know what, <laughs> sorry, I did this temporization <laughs> because I thought it would help me, but um, as well how uh, art and so, uh, specifically sound is connected to all these disciplines like physics, neuroscience, uh, cybernetic, technologies of recording and reproduction, uh, software-based art, media, new media communication, radio, live broad broadcasting, um, st uh, streaming uh, technologies, iPhones, as well, computation, engineering, cybernetics, neuroscience and physics, uh, synesthesia, and taxonomies of sound. So what uh, I've developed as well, uh, art theory that pretends uh, to present awareness on the constant evolution, uh, the awareness uh, in constant evolution of new media development and the idea of the progress uh, in technology and the influences of uh, the influences in preservation and sound practices. Um, so the first chapter is this, uh, uh, a definition of sound that helps me um, open the connections uh, in art theory to science. So uh, I, I, I depart from uh, this uh, physics uh, definition of sound as a vibratorial uh, medium that expands through waves. And I connected uh, this uh, physics uh, definition to the less. Um, for the less, um, this idea of systems uh, and how science has influenced the thought of and um, philosophies of uh, Gilles Deleuze, and this idea that he has the thought as a disturbed, uh, chaotic, and interrupted uh, processes of uh, processes of thought, and as well uh, all the advances in physics, like um, indeterminate Roding Schrodinger wave function, si systems collapse, uh, immeasurable, nonlinear, stochastic processes, non-simple processes, um, quantum, um, well, these ideas that comes from Werner uh, Eisenberg that uh, I discovered uh, when I was uh, working at Dali Foundation. He was uh, um, basing this idea of image and atomic uh, um, immateriality, so, and with the, the figure of uh, Heisenberg uh, in art is important uh, because it introduces this idea of the demons in science, that is the idea of the uncertainty uh, principle and the uh, heuristic argument. And there is something that um, I use as well as uh, the, this uh, process of science as a production of knowledge, understand as a, or the paradigm as a science, um, understand as a Welton's count that is the this, uh, the idea of the cosmic world or the vision of the world that it's something that art is universal because it expresses these universal processes. So uh, an analyzing science, uh, um, uh, I understand that rules and propositions are, are not uh, uh, finally uh, enough for uh, uh, argumenting a principle of truth. So uh, indeterminacy and determinism will be a dual binomial that will go all together like uh, philosophy and science. And there's another relation that is uh, 
art and technology, um, technology as a, as a, understood as a techne, as something that, uh, to cultivate, something that it helps humans to transform and control the environment, and this connects to cultural studies and uh, media techniques, um, where uh, the technology is studied and analyzed, um, interested as well in this idea of the self-reflexive uh, media, the self-exhibiting media or the introspective media that is like a, an effect, a baroque effect in electronic arts that where the media is uh, itself projecting uh, what is uh, exactly this uh, material. And uh, other idea is um, more influenced by um, signal analysis uh, in this idea of understanding te technology, um, how uh, technological pro processes are um, an expansion of non-verbal communication that are um, responding to a meta body and this idea is supported by signal analysis and in Simondon transaction and this idea of hardware and software in ma mind brain in Alan Turing. So um, the first chapter is, uh, is about sonic landscapes, is uh, artworks that have been produced in this uh, context, context of the environment uh, outside and uh, there are there are different uh, categories as well. Um, I've, uh, I've worked in four blogs like variable spaces, amplifying landscapes, satellites, technologies, and streaming networks. All of them are related to this idea of the soundscape that was developed by Murray Schaffer and how, uh, how the, the uh, outside the space uh, affects our um, sensory. And um, in this idea of variable spaces uh, um, uh, influenced by acoustic space and uh, this uh, idea of uh, uh, acoustic dim dim dimension, uh, uh, artists principally w working with resonances and what they uh, mic open microphones and working with uh, digital signal processors um, is the art is that they are just um, um, producing this idea of capturing the sound through the waves uh, um, of uh, the space and transforming this uh, space into an, a live ecosystem that produces uh, or that is transformed uh, through the technological medium. And artists like uh, Agostino Di Sipio or Peter Avlinger um, others uh, producing this generative art. Um, Agostino Di Sipio uh, has uh, worked with these uh, electroacoustics and is developing this idea of audible ecosystems that is, uh, is uh, producing this idea of uh, more, uh <laughs> an idea of uh, instead of a close uh, system of uh, uh, an object to analyze uh, something that is more open and determined by conditions like time, temperature, or um, surron surrounding uh, effects of the environment. And this idea of the variable space is uh, also influenced by the anaconic, uh, an anaconic uh, chamber by Athanasius Kirchner and as well uh, influenced by uh, the representation of the space in L'Enfant uh, by Jean Piaget. Um, there are different types of uh, understanding the space and one of them is the non, this non-Euclidean space. And finally, um, the idea of perception in Roy Ascot uh, that is defining this space that is surrounding us, uh, the landscape, that is definitely a no space, but a multimediated uh, reality with uh, multiple crossed messages. And following landscapes, there is uh, um, this uh, amplifying landscape. Amplifying landscape is a uh, is it represents artists that work more in the in the idea of field recording, um, working with uh, data, uh, biochemistry, and biology. And there's also as well um, 
this idea of capturing the landscape through field recording and as well uh, movements of surveillance, like uh, people working with iPhones and taking them um, and surveillance, like uh, artists uh, uh, representing themselves. Uh, uh, this idea of landscape. Um, there is uh, also uh, works uh, with an electromagnetics that I haven't not uh, profound, but I have collaborated in the psychogeophysics. Uh, it was in Transmediale 2010. That I think is another way of uh, producing art and curatorial disciplines as well, uh, presenting workshops and labs, and uh, as well uh, experimenting and uh, contributing uh, to research uh, with different um, methodologies. And there is another, um, and other technologies uh, that are producing sound, uh, are those related uh, to sound satellites. Um, there is a, it's very interesting to uh, understand curatorial practices from this point of view of uh, taking uh, references from um, science, like uh, for example, the polar plasma instrument that it was developed by Iowa University and it's for capturing the aurora waves. This model from the, um, from the University of Physics has been translated into a more, uh, in a, into a more art environment that it was the INSPIRE project. The INSPIRE project was founded by STEAM, uh, Science Engineering uh, Technology and Mathematics, uh, that this is a, another way of uh, opening the connections into fundraising and uh, cultural management. That's uh, what transdisciplinary um, allows us. And then um, another uh, typology of uh, collaborative lab and uh, exhibition is uh, s um, uh, orbiting uh, satellites that uh, I participated as well in 2010. It was curated by Pedro Solé. Um, and the, the thing interesting was that all the artworks that were presented in, in the exhibition were produced in the lab. So it was uh, is this idea again of the transformatory uh, collaborative lab and uh, the exhibition as lab. And it was uh, supported as well. Um, there were theoreticians, ter artists uh, and activists. Um, we produce a book as well. The exhibition catalog was um, a DIY. Uh, it was done meanwhile we were uh, staying there. And it was produced uh, through Bookie Technologies, a digital publisher print on demand. And um, the artists uh, were working uh, with the production of art artworks like videos, antennas, and and we were um, getting uh, communications from satellites and different uh, softwares uh, that we connect or we just transform were well, like Pure Data, Geneo Radio, um, uh, Open Rotor, and, uh, and Jeopardy. That was a software that was tracking the satellites and we use it for the exhibition as well. Three minutes. Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna finish. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, this is a streaming networks. I think uh, they, they have uh, is another part of uh, um, uh, streaming technologies. Uh, I consider them as well another part of sonic landscapes. And I've worked with this project that is a uh, Locus Sonos. That is an environment, a pure data environment, and a collective software that uh, you can use for, um, um, uh, it's like open Microsoft and, and you just stream your landscapes. And I'll exhibit it in Barcelona in 2009 and it allowed me to um, uh, introduce audiences into the, um, we invite uh, some students to the uh, exhibition space to uh, connect with the, um, with the tool and just uh, transform as well the exhibition space into a more educatorial lab. Uh, I'm sorry because uh, there are three more chapters that I cannot explain. That is uh, like uh, noise, uh, noise, noise responsive uh, systems that are more focused on uh, sound, neuro noise, biomusic, 
intermediate interactive Im immersive environments. And then as well, there is the last chapter that is software-based art when I analyze the possibilities to exhibit live coding or other software-based art. And finally, the epilogue based in female practices uh, in sound that I have no time here. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much, Laura. And I'm <laughs> we'll have a few minutes for questions for, for each of the presenters, but also everybody's um, around. You can talk to, to various folks. And, I'm, and Laura, I see you have a copy of your book with you, so that's great. So uh, it, it is 3 o'clock. Technically, that's the end of the session, um, but we do have a half an hour break. So if anybody needs to leave uh, right now, no problem, please do. But uh, why don't we just take 10 minutes for um, some questions and conversations. We'll finish at 10 past. You'll have a few more moments before the next panel starts at half past. So if I could open up the floor to any questions for the presenters, conversations, points that came up. We have a microphone here. Uh, the, I think the session is being recorded, so if you could, uh, we'll hand you the microphone if you'd like to ask a question. So the presenters can ask questions of each other as well. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that was a really interesting talk. Um, I thought it was quite generative the way you talked about how curation could be this um, possibility for um, opening up, uh, making connections and making certain things available. Um, I had a curi I, I was curious about Christiane's um, talk. I was writing down all these great artists and I thought they were all uh, the work that you showed was really beautiful. I was just wondering if there were very many women represented in the collection. Oh, uh, yeah, I think uh, there were quite a few women in what I showed. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Mata Boto is not a man, <laughs> Moira Sina is not a man. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, it's not a mix of 50-50 you know, necessarily, um, but there are definitely quite a few women in the collection, also in the works that were um, not historical okay. and supported. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, I have a question also for you. Uh, um, uh, and it's, it's about the, funnily enough, it's about the Dane. It's the Thomas uh, Wilfred, which yeah. I, I d actually uh, I knew a little bit about him, but the Clavilux um, Junior, they are in that collection that you're looking at, some of them, or? There are, and there, um, there actually is a quite sad story. There aren't um, too many of them around, and um, a collector bought, I think, a whole batch of oh. them, and then um, Erki Hutamo at some point went to visit that collector and was completely horrified when he discovered that the collector had stripped them of their casings mm -hmm. and embedded oh. the um, basically the screens in the walls because that's more contemporary, right? And effectively ruined the work. Mm -hmm. So he threw out the, uh, the casings. Oh no. I don't know how many of the juniors are left at this point. Oh. That's sad to hear. <laughs> I had another question. Um, I, I was just curious also, I'm, I'm sorry, but um, <coughs> the way you're working with this collection, is it going to be an uh, uh, exhibition or a uh, book project or what? Uh, no, it's not. Just to clarify um, that a little bit, um, David Vermont died, I think, around the 2000s, and mm. then his wife kept the collection going, and she also passed away a few years ago. So the residencies at the foundation are um, basically supported by the children who just want to um, bring people to the collection to write about it. So I wrote okay. um, an article about it. If you'd search for the um, title of my talk today, you also, f on Prezi, you find a Prezi with all of the um, mm. works um, in it. 
and another, um, Karen Moss was another resident there. She reinstalled the show in the space. There are tours. So the residencies are um, basically structured around okay. um, bringing attention to the collection. But, if you but were I did another, <laughs> no, another, <laughs> another thing on that front. I showed quite a few pieces from that collection in the exhibition um, feedback oh yeah. um, that I curated with Jemima Rally and Charlie Gear for the Laboral Art Center. Mm -hmm. So Duchamp, the Sina pieces, the Tangli, and uh, quite a few others were in there. One of the reasons being that when uh, Laboral opened, they didn't have climate control in place yet. And there's no way any museum would lend you these uh, pieces without that. So the Vermont Foundation was generous enough to, to do that. Not that there were horrible climate conditions within the space, but um, <laughs> basically that's something uh, curatorially that needs to be checked. Thank all of our presenters. Thank the audience. Uh, please feel free to mingle in the room, and we'll see you at uh, half past, either in this room or across the way for the last session for the day, which will be followed by other announcements and so forth. So thank you again very much.